not very often we see a crew-based game take to the skies, the seas, or even space, period. And when these games do come, they usually capture people's imaginations. That's what made Guns of Icarus Online so unique being a multiplayer steampunk first-person shooter set in the skies, where you and a crew of other players would captain, repair, and operate a gunship, attempt to fight other gunships, and utilize a variety of gunship's weapons, tools, and most important of all, communication at your disposal to do such. Created by indie NYC video game company Muse Games and originally crowdfunded humbly on Kickstarter, Guns of Icarus Online had extensive pre-launch coverage and hype and all signs publicly were pointing towards a sort of revitalization of the cruise ship market, or perhaps even the birth of a new one. With the success and launch of more recent titles such as Sea of Thieves and Last Oasis, and the possible launch of a behemoth capable of cruise ship space battle itself, Star Citizen. Crew-based gameplay isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's a personal favorite of mine, I might add as well, but not every title has had the same height or continued level of success, or hype, as the aforementioned titles. Sadly enough, Guns of Icarus Online, which launched on Steam October 2012, never managed to garner a large enough audience to have the same impact as other prominent titles in the market. Although Guns of Icarus Online had its success, it was quickly passed up for other titles in the space. This was even after Muse Games launched a PvE co-op expansion to the game, dubbed Alliance, that more spectacularly failed to match expectations and garner much of an audience at all. What went wrong with Guns of Icarus Online and its subsequent expansion Alliance? Why were they ultimately unable to garner a large audience despite significant effort? On this episode of Death of a Game, detectives, grab a wrench, and let's take to the skies as we attempt to diagnose this dying multiplayer steampunk crew shooter's largest contributing factors to its failures to stay in flight. This episode of Death of a Game is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. Ridge Wallet is a sleek, industrial, and ultimately light-designed, durable aluminum body wallet with a choice of a clip or strap, as well as over 30 colors and styles to choose from. My old wallet I got from a convenience store. <laughs> But the wallet was cheap, and not only could you tell that visually, its functionality was totally lacking. Sometimes my cards would fall out, and even my money. With my new Rich Wallet, I haven't had any of those issues. It even holds up to 12 cards plus your cash. And my new Ridge Wallet provides both a visual and functional upgrade. Best of all, Ridge Wallet is tiny and designed to fit in your front pocket. Most recently, Ridge Wallet afforded me the ability to buy a new microphone, a mic stand, a new chair, and a new desk so make sure to show them some extra love. But if you don't believe me, believe the other 40,000 five-star reviews. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash nerdslayer. That's ridge.com slash nerdslayer and use code nerdslayer, link in description. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Death of a Game, sponsored by Ridge Wallet. The story starts in the Big Apple. NYC is an expensive place to start video game development, but it has no shortage of talent. Muse Games would launch their first title, a browser game, Guns of Icarus, later also known as Flight of Icarus and then Guns of Icarus Classic in 2010. GameSpot wasn't very impressed with the title, giving it a 4 out of 10. They dubbed the title insanely overpriced at $8 on their website and $10 on Steam. But more damaging, they stated that the game wasn't very fun alone and had shallow gameplay that didn't evolve. At the core, the game was a third-person, basic aviator character-looking model, with poorly stitched together animations who ran around the ship and attempted to repair it as it took fire from enemy ships. Once you took control of the ship gun, and it became a very turret defense style of game. But still, there was that dangerous word there. Potential. A studio's first title, especially a browser or downloadable simplistic style title, not wowing people isn't really surprising. It's pretty normal, actually. But Muse Games' desire to monetize, on the other hand, was interesting to say the least. It must have been those New York rents. 2010 was a very competitive online space, and players weren't willing to spend $10 on an unproven developer for a hobby-like project. Muse Games went back to the drawing board, though, and started putting work into Guns of Icarus Online. Muse Games would showcase the first footage of the new version, now dubbed Guns of Icarus Online, allowing for cooperative cruise ship PvP gameplay. Guns of Icarus would shift to being a first-person title, which I wonder if it had anything to do with those old animations or the potential limitations they saw there. It would make the game feel potentially more immersive, which is usually what a crew-based game kind of tries to focus on. The gameplay footage itself showed clear upgrades and improvements from their previous game attempt, but the footage was still largely teaser-style and showed little of true substance. 
Muse Games was making an ambitious kind of game, one that didn't have an awful lot of competition for the time, but in spite of that, they still had to polish their design to make sure they could survive another launch of the game. Muse Games being an indie developer meant that they were going to need to either partner up with a publisher for funding, or rely on possible investment, or potentially, turn to crowdfunding. The Kickstarter for Guns of Icarus Online would launch December 23rd, 2011, asking for a mere 10,000 in funding, and would smash that with a cool 35,000. The contents of the original Kickstarter pitch are, well, they're kind of interesting, and a little bit of a mystery. I say that because, while well, I've been told by multiple sources, they used to describe the game originally to be a bit more open-worldly, sort of like an online game as the name implies. This, however, would quickly shift towards the game being more of a cooperative lobby-style shooter of a game, which is a large personal reason I didn't jump in on the Kickstarter or its early launch. Some people kind of expected, like myself, Guns of Icarus Online based on their initial pitch and kind of the name, to be more close to an MMO. Instead, Guns of Icarus Online was said to be a lobby-based shooter set in the air, equipped with large steampunk gunships, and tasked with eliminating the enemy gunship as a crew, but at the core, just a lobby shooter. The core of the game, as described on Kickstarter, was about three main roles. A captain role, a gunner role, and an engineering role. The captain would lead the ship, the gunner would shoot enemies out of the sky, and finally the engineer would tinker and repair things. You could choose amongst six different airships at launch that all had distinctive visual designs and deck layouts. The captain would then customize the loadouts for different gun stations, such as harpoons, flamethrowers, and machine guns. This gameplay shifts from being this open-world crew gunship experience to more of just a straight gunship shooter. This meant that the actual gameplay mechanics for combat and ship interaction kind of had to be lights out, because that was effectively all there was to do in the game. With a successful Kickstarter and sufficient interest garnered to attract a player base, Muse Games was positioning to make Guns of Icarus Online their flagship title. The main kicker would be that the fact that the game was multiplayer PvP only, and that could prove to be problematic later on. Muse Games would host the first closed beta for Guns of Icarus Online April 10th, 2012, allowing players for the first time to test the game before it was set to launch later that year. Muse Games even made a trip out to PAX East, getting valuable player and industry feedback for their soon-to-launch multiplayer title. There might be some hurdles for Muse Games to overcome as a fledgling game developer, but the good news was that people were showing interest. There was indeed a market. Guns of Icarus Online would launch on Steam October 29th, 2012 to a very successful 91% positive review score out of 8,200 players, with a population peaking at 1,300 players at the time. According to aggregate review website Metacritic, Guns of Icarus Online would score a more humbling 64 out of 100 there, while the audience would rate it a 7.8 out of 10. IGN, who covered the game, was more positive than most critics, giving the game a 7.3 out of 10, stating that in essence, Guns of Icarus is almost the airship battling game we always dreamed of, but bugs and limitations disrupt the fun. IGN was quick to acknowledge the interesting niche that Guns of Icarus Online was attempting, and the overwhelming enjoyment and desire for such a crew-based shooter title, but dubbed the project more close to a work in progress than an actual finished game. With a poor tutorial, it was difficult for players to ascertain what to do when not playing the gunner role, which as the name implied was rather simplistic and straightforward. In an always online crew-based game, one let alone three players running around with out an idea of what to do is a total nightmare. A total chicken with its head cut off scenario. It's already difficult to play a game that is completely based on cooperation, and piloting a giant ship, all the while some potentially overzealous or excited captain barked orders at you, and you're taking fire from enemy ships. Now that's a bit of the charm of such games, after all. The crazy hectic nail-biting suspense field exchanges that required that much focus and communication to accomplish a goal. As much as crew-based games can be a recipe for fun, though, as you can kind of see, they can be one for disaster, too. Once you actually did learn how the game worked in Guns of Icarus Online and how each of the classes worked, you quickly realized a core fundamental issue with the game. Each of the three roles, Captain, Gunner, and Engineer, were ultimately not very deep. Depth isn't required for fun, ultimately, but for an always online crew-based cooperative multiplayer game, sooner or later people are going to grow bored of such simplistic roles. The most common complaint with Guns of Icarus Online is actually the roles. Many players felt that the captain took too much knowledge or skill to be desired by new players, or even moderate players. A bad captain meant that your ship was going to remain grounded, but more importantly, a captain was intimidating to play in a random matchmaking setting because it meant that you could have three players teaming up on hating you and no one wants that. Players felt that the most damaging thing, though, was the engineering role, which your ship often required two of them, because it was one of the most boring roles. The role itself consisted of running from asset to asset, repairing them from taking damage with your hammer. In a nutshell, that's it. 
Sure, in a competitive multiplayer environment, it's a lot more complicated than that. But at the core, the essence of playing Engineer and Guns of Icarus online was banging your hammer on things until they repaired. This resulted in players leaving when they got this role in matchmaking, which created an even bigger issue with balanced matchmaking, and sometimes lobbies even struggled to start in the first place. Guns of Icarus Online was doing well after its launch, but the cracks were already beginning to show early on, both in design and the new player experience. Still, as with most promising indie titles that have less than perfect launches, but show promise or potential, fans of Guns of Icarus Online were confident that the developers would be able to create new content to keep players interested and fix current issues regarding performance and the design of the game. Anytime you're asking a developer to fix core issues of game design though, I personally think it's a bit of a losing battle, especially an indie developer. It's much easier to add a new ship or map to the game than it is to fix core design issues. The engine was limited ultimately, as was the gameplay. And Muse games, no matter how much content they pumped into the game, wasn't very likely to be able to impress new players enough or keep current players impressed for long enough. Being a crew-based game meant that Guns of Icarus Online was incredibly reliant on a player base to keep the game running. What Guns of Icarus Online was severely lacking, which could help break up monotony and the oftentimes insanity of just queuing for random matchmaking, was a single-player or cooperative AI mode. Although Guns of Icarus Online was selling well, and has historically sold well, at between 2 to 5 million copies, the issue was that the player base wasn't there. Sure, people were willing to actually pay the low price of entry to buy the game and play it for a bit, which ranged between 5 to ten dollars, a very low and fair price for a video game in general, but especially the quality of Guns of Icarus Online. That's how the game managed to be so positively reviewed, even when the game had clear issues and a small concurrent audience. It's sort of this price tag versus expectation sort of thing. That wasn't helping Muse Games though, who needed a healthy population for their always online multiplayer game to keep living. 2013 would prove to be a successful year for Guns of Icarus Online. As it gained in population overall, the peak and average player amounts kept rapidly changing, but the numbers were ultimately rather humble at under 3,000 players peak. Guns of Icarus Online would introduce more maps, airships, and customization options meant to break up more of the repetition of the game, but they seemed to be aware of the aforementioned issues regarding lack of PvE content. Coming as a surprise to the players, Muse Games would announce yet another Kickstarter, this time for a PvE adventure mode component for Guns of Icarus Online dubbed Alliance. This expansion was set to solve not only the lack of PvE in Guns of Icarus, but also the overall limited lobby nature of the game. According to the original pitch, Alliance would add missions that are generated by towns and factions who operate them. Some would be typical fighting missions, while others would range from trading to raiding missions. Launched on March 22nd, 2013, the Kickstarter for Alliance would ask for a goal of 100,000 this time, and eclipse that goal with nearly double at 198,000. Meanwhile, Guns of Icarus Online would continue to chug on, but at a pace that wouldn't be making any gains in population for long, and ultimately by the end of 2014, the average concurrent player base had dropped, while peak numbers were higher, which kind of implies a sale or some sort of free playtime. Alliance was set to launch in 2014 originally, but that launch didn't come. Instead, they had a rather uneventful year, likely in an effort to focus on their upcoming expansion that was already behind schedule. To start things off in 2015, Muse Games was changing their design on things such as the capture point mechanic featured in the game and more. This goes back to my previous point of launching a less than complete project due to limitations as an indie developer with limited resources. It felt like they didn't have the time or the energy to devote to fixing their core design when they needed more content, and simply speaking, more to do. Although launch wouldn't come in 2015 either for the Alliance expansion, the alpha testing was opened up as the price of the game was now set at $10. 2015, however, would prove to be the first year in record that the concurrent population according to Steam charts for Guns of Icarus Online would drop and not uptrend the ending year. 2016 would be a year where although Guns of Icarus Online would open up their Alpha of Alliance to the public in August, all the while they were now prepping for their new launch date sometime in 2017. At this point though, who was really paying attention? With the population data in 2016 as poor as it's ever been for the title, most fans who originally backed the expected expansion probably had either moved on, took their losses, or had had their hype subsided. At this point, it was two years after the promised launch, and four years after the launch of the original game. As the launch date moved further and further, the scope of the original Kickstarter for the expansion shrunk more and more. This included them literally removing certain verbiage and such in the Kickstarter post. This much is mentioned if you read the comments on the Kickstarter itself. Muse Games was gambling on the potential success of their third iteration of Guns of Icarus in a newly updated engine. Delayed launch or not, 
they had no choice but to launch the game, otherwise it surely meant the death of Guns of Icarus Online. Alliance would finally launch March 31st, 2017, to quite a quiet reception. While Alliance was clearly an upgrade in nearly every way compared to the original game, now with PvE content and more cooperative content in general, and well, just more to do, period, the issue was nobody was paying attention to the launch. I mean, Metacritic doesn't even have critical reviews listed for the game, or even player reviews. It seems like no major critics really covered it. Meanwhile, on Steam, the game managed to score an 80% from a mere 500 reviews. According to Steam Spy, Alliance only sold between 100,000 and 200,000 copies total, which is staggeringly low compared to their previous millions. There were a couple reasons why, well, people weren't buying and playing Alliance, and quality I don't think was the main reason. In fact, the expansion was an upgrade to Guns of Icarus Online in nearly every conceivable way. It added way more in the ways of persistence, tried to leverage the lobby-based nature over a map like Battlefield did, and upgraded visuals and overall gameplay itself. One of the reasons people weren't buying Alliance was, it was three to four times more expensive than the original game. The early buy-in price for the game was $20, and on Steam the launch had the price at $15. The second reason, and it's even more obvious, is how long it took for the expansion to come out. In 2017, the expansion was technically three years later than it was supposed to be. On top of that, Guns of Icarus as a game and concept had been around for already five years by that point. They weren't the only player in town now. With other early rumblings and announcements of Sea of Thieves, another crew-based title, this time, as the name implies, set in the sea and backed by the powerful Microsoft. To sum it up, Guns of Icarus Alliance and its rather immediate failures to garner an audience, although the expansion was a much-needed upgrade, it was still not enough progress to match the expectations players and the market in general had of the title at the time. Guns of Icarus Online after the launch of the expansion was losing population, and the numbers were the lowest they had ever been. This is sort of to be expected because Muse Games took a risk. They figured enough of their original or new audience would purchase the new expansion to warrant the price and development focus, only it didn't work out that way. And now their original title was floundering more because of it. And for what? These population numbers? They're even worse than Guns of Icarus. Although Alliance had a cooperative component to it, the online component of the game was even more population-reliant than the previous game. Straight out of the gate, Alliance was already dead in the water, and it had an AI component so it could be played with your friends, and still less people were playing that than the original game. Meanwhile, 2018 would see the launch and success of Sea of Thieves, which continues to this day to be a powerhouse of a title. The next play by Muse Games won't surprise veterans of this series, but it might have surprised players of the game itself. Muse Games would be bringing Guns of Icarus Alliance to PS4 as announced on March 29th, 2018. The playbook here says that Muse Games recognized their PC efforts weren't paying off anymore, and frankly speaking, their title was perfect for consoles and perhaps would have been better suited there originally. But anytime you have to port a PC title to a console, there's going to be complications and time slash resources devoted to doing such. Resources that perhaps could have been better suited focusing on their PC effort. Nonetheless, Alliance would launch on PS4 May 1st, 2018. On aggregate review website Metacritic, the title would score a 67 out of 100 from 9 critics. Sales numbers and population data aren't shared for the PS4 port, but usually when you do particularly well, you kind of show it off, right? Muse Games almost attempting to make up for old times would be rather active in 2018, putting out at least two major updates on top of their PS4 launch for Alliance. These updates would add new PvE maps, a new mode team brawl, new ships, and some faction-specific balancing and costumes. The population didn't seem to move much at all following the updates, unfortunately, though. In 2019 would bring more updates and Steam sales, meant to bring back players to the game, as well as new players to the game, adding another new map and a new game mode sunk in base defense, and some more customization options. It was seeming, however, by 2019, the past two years had been two years of basically just two updates each year, and slim pickings elsewise. This could be attributed to the difficulty of updating the game, the return on the investment, or the fact that Muse Games wasn't banking on Guns of Icarus as a franchise anymore. They had begun working on other titles behind the scenes, such as Hempsterdam, a mobile PC brawler which launched in 2019, and Ember, a firefighter simulator game, which launched later in 2020. By the end of 2019, Guns of Icarus had sunk to mere 17 concurrent players average, with 143 peak, while Alliance wasn't doing any better at 14 and 59 respectively. The last big update that I have seen for Guns of Icarus would come June 1st, 2020, 
2020, where they introduced a new map along with other minor changes. Closing out 2020 for both versions of the game according to Steam charts would be more of the same. With average concurrent player base being 18 players for both games, it wasn't looking like either game would be making a comeback. Guns of Icarus Online in 2021 isn't faring any better, with peak numbers lower than ever before and average concurrent player base for both games being at 15 players now. Effectively, the only way to reliably play Alliance would be to queue with your friends against the AI. That means that we're reaching the end of this video, and perhaps soon, the game itself. But there's no minor update at this point that's going to suddenly resurrect the dying population in either version of Guns of Icarus. Before we get into the final deduction portion of the video, let's make sure that we've covered all of our bases. The most clear issue you can literally see regarding Guns of Icarus Online is the game's population. But how do we explain population as a reason a game fails? Because it's kind of self-explanatory, right? If the game's an online game and it doesn't have enough players, then it can't function, right? The first thing people inevitably point to is going to be the advertisement of a game. In the case of Guns of Icarus Online, this doesn't follow. Not only did they put significant effort into contacting content creators and having events with them, they ultimately sold millions of copies. It wasn't like they didn't literally have the player base, they had enough players who bought the game. The issue was, is those players weren't sticking around. That is more of an issue of the design of the game, as we have outlined before, either not offering enough to last in the ways of content, or the game itself doesn't lend itself to longevity of play. In the case of Guns of Icarus Online, it kinda seems to be both. Alright detectives, it's finally that time of the video. Yep, you guessed it, and you probably heard the music. It's catchy, isn't it? It's deduction time, and I want to make sure you guys have been keeping up with the clues and evidence concerning the largest contributing factors of the death of a game, Guns of Icarus Online, and its expansion, Alliance. Suffer design limitations, where only one of the three classes was really preferred. Alliance's price tag was relatively too high to the original price and content offered. Alliance launched too late, and nobody was around to play it when it did. Severe lack of long-term progression means and long-term content concerns. Fundamentally limited design and scope kept this game grounded when it could have been flying. If you're gonna make a new expansion trying to target the cooperative versus player environment players, you should probably make the game playable offline. Guns of Icarus Online for me was and is a story of what could have been. Muse Games stated early on that they did indeed have intentions of making their game an MMO, but that it was going to have to be a point of evolution for them to get there realistically. And that's fair, making online worlds is hard, much harder than making a lobby shooter. But ultimately there's always this question of, what could have been? What if Guns of Icarus Online, like the name implied, was really an online game? Like what if you can do more than just fight enemy pilots? What if you could use the money you gain from piloting gunning or being an engineer, and use that to customize your character more personally? What if there was an actual ground portion, player housing, and many of the traditional MMORPG-like features? This is what initially sold many of us on Guns of Icarus Online. It was that potential, and probably what motivates us on the upcoming behemoth of a crowdfunded project that is probably never going to launch, Star Citizen. I kid. The potential for limitless fun, exploration, and working together with others to accomplish goals in an online world. Cruise ship games and massive multiplayer games aren't very common, but when they do happen, they're pretty awesome. One of my favorites is none other than the pioneer sandbox MMORPG Star Wars Galaxies. With the first expansion to the game, Jump to Lightspeed, they added in crew-based space combat. Whether you were going to solo pilot a fighter, or have a crew on a YT-2020, or an even larger crew on a gunship, the difference between that experience and what Guns of Icarus Online was is why I think people were ultimately let down. In Star Wars Galaxies, you can be a crafter, a trader, a combatant, a Jedi, a pilot, or even a dancer. You weren't just stuck on a ship the entirety of the game with a limited role and moveset. I'm not going to sit here and declare that a matchmaking based cruise ship online game can't work, I just think it takes more money and resources, and frankly speaking, a more in-depth meta than Guns of Icarus was able to offer ultimately. And while some can say most of this is just the audience having the wrong idea of what the game was supposed to be about, the original Kickstarter set high expectations that the game was never able to reach, despite being a good game after all. Thanks for watching, guys. Hey, hey, I'm Chatty, and this is Free Realms. 